dreams do you think were most common or most desirable dreams area? Oh, well, I grew up in the early hybrid area, and I think one of my one of my favorite stories to think back to was our video teacher, Mr. Balmer, who drove a uh, Honda Insight, which was like 2003-ish uh, Honda Hybrid that had. Um, rear fenders kind of blocking the wheels, very bizarre looking vehicle, but it was one of the early hybrids that get, got 60 plus miles on the highway. <laughs> and one of my favorite memories from senior year was watching Mr. Balmer drive by the sidewalk in his, in his Honda Insight and um, hearing some of my classmates uh, yell insults at our teacher, Mr. Balmer, specifically about his car. And to me, that, that moment kind of encapsulated so much of that era. You have this progressive individual who is trying to make steps to cut down on his carbon pr footprint and trying to make, make steps to, you know, better the world around him. And then you've got a bunch of idiots, um, you know, yelling at him because his car looks kind of funny. Um, and I, I think that, like, those early hybrids were very interesting because to convince American drivers that they should sacrifice performance and good looks for, I mean, uh, gas prices were high, but they weren't, you know, they weren't, um, they weren't so high that it was impacting a lot of Americans who now drive hybrids just simply because they're convenient, they're better looking, they're good, reliable cars. So convincing the American public to move from SUVs, which are, you know, stunning, stunning, colossal, you know, monuments to American automobile engineering and getting them crammed into these, these tiny, hideous hybrids that just pathetically wheeze up, up hills, I, I think was, was very much, a, uh, to use that hill again, like very much an uphill battle um, for the car manufacturers, and, but one that, you know, reveals that I think Americans at, at their core do have a heart. I don't think that everybody that buys a hybrid is simply for the fuel economy. I think that we do want to believe in, in change. We do want to believe that, you know, despite the fact that we create, um, you know, significant amounts of waste on a daily basis, that we can do something to maybe change it. And I think that um, that sort of Mr. Balmer moment was interesting because that wouldn't happen nowadays. and you know, that kind of signaled a change towards a more Earth-conscious approach nationwide that I think I'm roughly proud to say, you know, that now we can say, you know, hybrids are almost an American thing, and it's kind of cool. What do you think were some desirable or respected job streams here? Ooh. So desirable or respected jobs, I would say the one that, that led to a big influx in enrollment at law schools was law. I mean, I think a lot of people... Um, viewed law as a safe avenue to a six-figure job and one that could provide a clear path to economic and economic success and personal fulfillment and a rewarding career, all that good stuff. Um, but I mean, you see now the market's saturated with, you know, individuals with law degrees that are struggling to get, you know, a lot of them are going into teaching because it's so difficult to find employment, and um, I'm kind of wondering if that trend is going to continue and that, you know, it was law school 10 years ago, and I wonder if engineering is next. I hope it's not, because I don't want to have to work with my former students after they come back from, <laughs> you know, from college with their uh, mechanical engineering degrees. I, I don't necessarily want them as colleagues. I want them to be <laughs> successful in their respective fields, but yeah, law was definitely a big one back in that. And I, I keep going back to my, my era, in my opinion, is, you know, 2006, 2007, 2008, when I was just graduating high school and moving on into, move around a little bit, and moving on into college. What were some de desirable and respected jobs during this era? I think so. Doctors and white collar jobs were more respected at that time. And what vehicles do you think were prominent during this era? Vehicles, uh, what comes to my mind is like Ford, GM, Chrysler, I think so they were most common at that time. Okay. Are you proud to be an American? Oh yes, I'm proud to be an American. Some desirable or respected jobs during this era? 
Oh yeah, so during my period when I got graduated from college uh, and looking for a job, so yes, yeah, so I think due to the time, uh, and I'm coming from India, and I graduated from uh, an Indian school, so uh, basically engineering and science stream was uh, the most uh, desirable and uh, profit, uh, basically career-wise, the best stream to go for. So from parents' perspective, they wanted to make their all their kids to go and graduate as engineers. So I became engineer. I did my computer engineering, and uh, it was a it, this field was evolving that time. So easy to get the job, mo very respect uh, uh, socially very respected uh, kind of a status that you are a computer engineer. So I think it was anybody's dream at that time to become a computer engineer, and uh, and uh, not only and. And at that time, I think it was a defining moment where many startups or new computer companies were popping up gradually. And before that, it was more like people used to go in the government jobs. But computer engineering opened that uh, a new uh, private sector opportunity for engineers. Yeah. What jobs do you think would be most respected during this era? Oh, uh, you mean during the Cold War? What jobs yes. Would be, well. Um, Hmm. There's a term people joke about now, and they say, well, it's not rocket science. And the basis for that is that people at the time considered rocket science was something very, very, very hard to do. And the people who could do it must be very, very smart, capable people. So there was a lot of respect for um, folks who could do serious scientific work then. Um, and I think that. Uh, I wasn't alive earlier to know, but my impression is that people saw more direct influence on, uh, from scientific research on their daily lives and on their own safety than probably had been true in any other era. Um, people always had respect for doctors because they depend upon them. Um, so that's a different form of technical education, you know, life sciences rather than the hard sciences. Um, no one's ever really liked politicians much, so there's no particular respect then. Um, but generally, in general, it was a time of economic growth, um, and people who were helping build and develop were looked upon as respect, uh, respectable people. In terms of transportation, there were been a, there's been a slow evolution for automotive things. I mean, in the 50s, cars were huge, heavy things, very inefficient, made lots of smog, and Cars today handle much better, stop faster, get better gas mileage, create much less pollution. They're much, much safer. We used to have terrible carnage on the highways because I'm, I'd actually never worn a seatbelt until I was about probably 14 because the cars didn't have them. They weren't required. There were no airbags. Um, if you got into an accident, your likelihood of being killed was very, very high. There's no airbag to go off, no seatbelt to restrain you and the cars did not have crumple zones built in or engineered or anything like that. The whole idea of safety in cars was uh, a, a really, really low priority. Styling was what everybody was after. They wanted cars that looked sleek and neat, had fins on the back and things like that. So um, the development of a safety culture took a long while for that. Um, but for transportation for me otherwise, I think the biggest change has been uh, in air travel. Uh, it used to be that Many people traveled by uh, airplanes that had piston engines with propellers on them. And the jet age came about starting basically in the late 50s when jet airliners started to come in. But there was no free market competition for that. It was all regulated. And the result was that the prices were outrageously high. So ordinary people didn't fly on airplanes. You wouldn't hop on an airplane for your vacation to go back someplace for Christmas or spring break, whatever, unless you were really rich. The jet set is what everybody called them, you know, the people who could afford to do that. And the, the wealthy and the celebrities traveled by jet airplane. Everybody else traveled by bus or train or car because it was very expensive to go by air. And that changed eventually when they deregulated the airlines and fares started to come down. There was real competition for it. Um, and now people, the airplanes now are what the buses were then. Um, if you went to an airport in the old days, you people would dress up. I mean, if you're going to go ride on an airplane, people would wear a suit and tie just to ride on the plane. You know, now people get on them, you know, looking as sloppily as you can possibly imagine because it's just, you know, like sitting on a bus somewhere. 
it was a big deal then. You paid an outrageous sum for it by in relative terms in then year dollars. Um, and it was uh, a formal social event and a big deal to go on. By the same token, there was no security at airports. You could walk right up to the gate, you know, hug somebody goodbye as they're stepping onto the airplane. You know, there was no no metal detectors to go through, nothing like that. And the idea of hijacking a plane was a, or doing anything nasty with it had never occurred to anybody. It just didn't happen. There was no security around it because nobody perceived any need for it. So if you were a rich person, you could afford the ticket, you could fly by, you'd go by air, and you had no security to deal with. If you weren't a rich person, you might take a train or a bus, or you'd do long road trips. If you did a long road trip, it was in a car that got horrible gas mileage. You know, I'm talking 9 to 11 miles per gallon, made lots of smog. Uh, gas was 25 cents a gallon at the time. Um, and if you had an accident, God help you, because the cars were death traps.